everybody. Welcome back to some U.S. History Notes. Uh, <clears throat> so last week I had done a section of notes kind of going over all the like rotten aspects of racism uh, and essentially what the black community was going through. A lot of that was really doom and gloom because that's a real part of history too. We're uh, talking about lynchings and like Jim Crow laws and all those, you know, just kind of horrific things. And we looked at it through the experience and kind of life narrative of Jack Johnson. <clears throat> who I thought was a pretty interesting guy. Uh, this lecture today was going to kind of piggyback off of some of that and talk a little bit about race too. But this one will be less doom and gloom and kind of looking at the maybe silver lining to some of that and some of the, the good aspects and good things that were happening in the black community back at that time. Uh, you often find even in like times of like terrible oppression and where people or a group of people is facing a lot of hardship, often that's when a lot of like the best art uh, in the most meaningful, impactful kinds of like art and cultural things uh, will kind of spring to life and bloom out of those really dark, trying times. So what we're going to talk about today, this would be tacked onto your 1920s or your Roaring Twenties notes page that's been going. And I've dropped a few different things that you, you've kind of put in subheadings on that page. Uh, there'll be two things that you're putting in today. <clears throat> The first one, I title it out just like what I have here on the, the the screen that you can see right now is the Harlem Renaissance. Now, Harlem, where is Harlem? Most of you have probably heard it before, or heard of like the Harlem Globetrotters. That's a neighborhood in New York City uh, that was predominantly black back in this era. And I believe it still is to this day, uh, but probably, you know, kind of less exclusive today, I think, in modern times. Although I've never really gone and visited New York City and don't have a lot to say firsthand about it. Uh, but Harlem, for sure, you go back into the 1920s, <clears throat> it's an all-black neighborhood in New York. And if you think back to, like, uh, The Lost Battalion, that movie about World War I, which would have been just a few years before this, we looked at the guys of the 308th Battalion, and they were all out of Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> but you that's why it was a very diverse unit. And in that movie, they talk about how there's Irish neighborhoods and Polish neighborhoods and Italian ones and Jewish ones. Uh, and of course, there were no black guys in that unit because the army was still segregated and blacks wouldn't serve in a regular unit like the 308. Uh, but New York City was very much <clears throat> kind of like a puzzle board or something where it was all, you know, this big, huge, diverse city. Uh, but then in the surrounding like boroughs where people live, you would have neighborhoods that are kind of specifically one ethnic group or another uh, one racial group. So in addition to all like the Italian neighborhoods, Irish, Polish, et cetera, et cetera. You have Harlem, which is a predominantly black neighborhood. Okay. So that's where that term comes from. And then the Renaissance means like, if you think of like the Renaissance that happened in Europe several hundred years before this, <clears throat> it's like a cultural awakening where all kinds of good art comes out of it. Uh, kind of like a rebirth, reawakening type thing. Uh, so anyways, Harlem Renaissance is kind of like a, a cultural awakening within the black community. All right. Next up, okay, so things that would tie into the Car Harlem Renaissance. Now, I would have liked to have played a little bit more jazz music for you or maybe do like a reading comprehension quiz, but because we're in such a crunch for time here at the end of the semester and I just really haven't gotten enough stuff covered for you, I'm doing a little bit of catch up here, so I'm not going to give uh, a ton of different little assignments that tie into this. Next year, I probably tr will try to do so. Um, anyway, what I would want you to know, though, and list off under the Harlem Renaissance, it applies to basically any kind of art that you could think of. So like jazz, which is the soundtrack of the 1920s, this really new kind of innovative music music with a fast rhythm and beat. You have trumpets, a wide orchestra. You'll have some singing involved. Uh, jazz music, which really sweeps America and sweeps the world. It becomes popular all the way over in Europe and across the Pacific and Japan, uh, it really does become uh, the dominant kind of music for a while on, on planet Earth, I would say, and, and the most popular new happening music. Well, that music, jazz, is an American invention, uh, <clears throat> and it specifically comes out of the black community in America. So jazz music really kind of comes out of two places, New Orleans and Chicago. Those are kind of the homes of like jazz music, one in the north, one in the south. But then it spreads around the whole country and you would find jazz clubs in every major American city, whether it's Detroit or Philadelphia, New York, wherever. Uh, so no, jazz music kind of comes out of the black community. That's something that I'd want you to have. We probably will have a few questions. and I might do another lesson that just ties into just specifically jazz music and gives you 
some examples. We'll see if I can fit that in or not. Uh, but in addition, for the Harlem Renaissance, I'd say jazz is kind of the big, the biggest contribution. All right, but paintings, poetry, novels, acting, entertainment—you uh, really see kind of an explosion in black creativity and talent uh, that isn't just for the black community. Like I said, jazz music uh, initially it was popular within the black community but it very much caught on in white America. And then you have white musicians mimicking a lot of that stuff and playing it for white audiences. But, but that was one area where uh, <clears throat> the culture probably wasn't as rigidly divided because it wasn't uncommon for white people to go see black musicians play jazz music. That was seen as like culturally acceptable uh, in most places. But, it, you know, just I want you to know that kind of the Harlem Renaissance applies to all kinds of different uh, art that flourishes in the 1920s within the black community. And it's happening in black city or in cities across America in these black neighborhoods, because most cities were kind of like New York. And I'll go on to the next slide here. Most cities were kind of like New York where they were divided up by racial and ethnic groups. You'd have black neighborhoods and then you'd have white neighborhoods. And within the white neighborhoods, you'd have those broken up by people of uh, different backgrounds and whatnot. Uh, so where is it happening? I want you to know, put another point on here, even though it's called the Harlem Renaissance, it's happening in all the major cities in America, Detroit, Chicago, out in LA, down South and New Orleans and Atlanta, uh, and including uh, New York too. And it all gets ca called the Harlem Renaissance because that was like the biggest black community, the biggest black neighborhood in America at the time, which kind of makes sense because New York is the biggest city in America back then and it still is today. So it's a, it's occurring to some extent in all major American cities, but it all gets kind of called the Harlem Renaissance because that was kind of be, became the hub of the black community and cultural creativity was what was going on in New York City in the neighborhood of Harlem. Uh, so I want you to know it was in New York City too. Make sure you put a little note about uh, that in there. Uh, the guy you can't see there is Louis Armstrong. Uh, my mug is blocking him. I'll move my face here. Louis Armstrong, who is a really famous trumpet player, he becomes one of quite a few different, very prominent jazz musicians uh, that's popular really in black and white America. Uh, kind of tr transcended uh, race in some ways that his music was so popular and really kind of everybody liked listening to him. <clears throat> All right, next up, here's the second heading that I'll give you for the notes today. I want you to put in below Harlem Renaissance, the Great Migration. Now, in the last chunk of notes that I talked about, uh, was talking about race, <clears throat> you could see that like I kind of broke the country up into three big regions. Uh, generally, it's four regions in the country, but I lumped the Midwest where we live and like the Northeast, which is where New York is kind of together. I just called that like the Northern states or back in civil war times, those would have been the free states. Um, <clears throat> then you have out West kind of California where the Rocky mountains are, the whole West side of the country and then the South. Uh, and I kind of broke it down. Like basically racial oppression was worse the, by far the worst in the Southern states where the Jim Crow laws were the former slaveholding states. It was kind of a, middle ground in the northern states through the Midwest, that region. And it was probably the most progressive out in the western states uh, because the population was still really low out then and they were trying to recruit people out so blacks could actually enjoy probably a better lifestyle out in California or anywhere out on the west coast. Uh, but it was also hardest to get there because you still had to take a really long train ride to, to get out to that part of the country. This is before we have, everybody's got cars, a lot of people do, but you know, many uh, poorer families would not. And it's before like the highway system and all that. Uh, so the great migration, essentially what's going on with this is <clears throat> because racial oppression was the worst and the conditions are the worst down South and also down South, which is where the, the slaveholding states had been, that's where the bulk of the black community still resided and lived. And most of them, even though they're not slaves anymore, most of them now are sharecroppers or tenant farmers, which essentially means you're, you're not a slave, but you don't have land. You probably don't have your own farm equipment. You're very poor and you basically work for like really substandard wages on a big white owned farmer plantation. And you're just going to go in and farm your crops on white owned fields. And then you'll get a little cut of the profits. And when I say a little cut, I mean a pretty little cut. Uh, these people were the blacks down south were kept in pretty extreme poverty back in this era. Uh, so because conditions really suck for the black community down south, you can see why 
a lot of blacks would want to get out of the South if they could. Uh, and then up North in the 1920s, the North is where the country is really heavily industrializing. Like we had talked about Henry Ford starting Ford Motor Company and then Michigan and specifically Detroit becomes kind of the home of the auto industry where there's all kinds of good high paying factory jobs there. Uh, Henry Ford, who I, I know I mentioned this way back at the beginning of the semester, but he was a weird guy because in some respects he was very like racist. Uh, he was very much hated Jews. Remember he got some like Nazi awards and he wouldn't hire Jews in any of his factories. But on the other hand, he was kind of progressive in that he actually recruited like Muslims to come over here. He brought a lot of people over from Arabia. Uh, that's why Dearborn, Michigan has the most concentrated Muslim population in America today. In addition to that, he also was very open to hiring black laborers. Okay. So he's kind of a conundrum when uh, that one guy that we're looking at where he's, he's racist, very racist in some respects, but then kind of progressive in others. Also, he was one of the only factory owners at the time when he bumped it up to that $5 a day wage. Uh, that was a really good money at that time for white workers too. He mandated that even black workers are going to make the same amount of money. Now today you couldn't just say like, have a, you say somebody black is going to make less money than somebody white. You know what I mean? That we have laws that kind of forbid that from happening today. But back at this time, those laws didn't exist. So most factory owners actually did pay black workers less for doing the exact same job. Henry Ford actually fought the union. The unions wanted him to pay black workers less and he refused to. So anyway, even though in a lot of factories, black workers wouldn't make as much money up north, there were more opportunities. Even making a substandard wage in a northern factory is still going to be more money, better money than being a sharecropper or tenant farmer down south. Uh, and then maybe you get into a place like Ford where you're making a really good wage uh, of money and you're making exactly the same as uh, what, what white workers would make too. So anyway, there are more opportunities up north. So what I want you to do below this one, and it might look a little bit different from normal notes where you're just bullet pointing everything. I want you to make a little column below the, or like a T-chart basically below the Great Migration. And I think anytime you see a big migration of people where people are moving from one region to another, you can kind of sum it up into two general categories of why they're moving. There are push factors and pull factors. Push factors are bad things that are happening in one area that are pushing people away. Like if you were a Jew living in Germany in the early 1930s, well, pff, that's when the Nazi party's coming to power. There's a whole lot of push factors. A lot of Jews that had money and had means, they want to get the heck out of there. Guys like Albert Einstein, they he had money. The good scientist, he migrated to America and got the heck out of Germany because he could see trouble brewing. Well, if you're down south uh, in the 19 teens to 20s, you know, there's a lot of push factors pushing you out of the southern states. Then in addition to that, if you look up north or out west, there are some pull factors uh, where things aren't like perfect for the black community up here by any stretch, but it's better up here. And it's things that are attracting uh, blacks to come up to northern states or out west. So to sum up for you quickly, the push factors. So down south, these are all terms you hopefully are familiar with now. There's segregation division by you know race where it's just like just black and white are going to be separated bathrooms schools everything busing uh you know there's black places white places and we don't mix them down south that was kind of the attitude so extreme segregation you have discrimination where they're just going to be treated differently and be second class citizens you have the jim crow laws which is just any law that kind of uh segregates and discriminates all right those those racist laws that were down south now up north there was a lot of segregation too and discrimination going on but i again i'll just emphasize it wasn't as severe as it was down south uh there's less economic opportunities and that's for everybody down south just in general especially back in this era white people black people they were all kind of poorer down south uh and that's kind of remnants of the civil war and it's just that the southern states weren't as heavily industrialized they didn't have the factories going and the steel industry and automotive industry and things like that all the manufacturing so less opportunities for everybody down south and when you have a society down south that is extremely segregated well if the white people are poor the black people are going to be way further down that totem pole and, and much poorer yet. Uh, also, the education system just wasn't as good. And that's kind of true for blacks and whites, but especially for blacks, because again, schools were segregated uh, and they were state funded. So like white schools, 
even though white schools down south weren't as good as northern schools, the black schools got even like half the funding that the white schools got. So education system really sucked down in those southern states back in this era. Uh, now for pull factors up north, there's no legal segregation. Now there was a lot of like unofficial, just cultural segregation where it was still would have been even up in the northern states. It was kind of taboo for there to be an interracial marriage, say. Uh, and in most places, you didn't have like really mixed schools. Uh, but usually it wasn't because of a law. It was just because kind of like in Harlem, you had black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. And then whatever school is in that community is going to serve the people that live there. So there was segregation, but it wasn't like written into the law. Uh, there's I don't want to say the black community is totally accepted up north, but they're more accepted up north than they were down south. Uh, also, there's just better job job opportunities across the board. You can make more money, whether you're black or white. So actually, in addition to black people moving up north, uh, a lot of white people moved up north, too, for these opportunities. It was just a, an exodus out of the southern states. For example, a uh, personal story from my family, my mom's side of the family and her, my her maiden name would be James. Uh, both of my grandparents on my mom's side were poor farmers in Kentucky. They were born as poor farmers and didn't really have a whole lot. Had a hard time putting food on the table. Luckily, they had a farm so they could grow most of the crops that they were going to eat through the year. But they were pretty darn dirt poor uh, from my understanding of it. And then both of my great grandpas ended up, this would have been right around this time in the 1920s, they ended up deciding to leave Kentucky and they came up north to Detroit to work in the auto industry. And I, from everything I've ever heard from family stories, their lives got better and they made more money and just had a better chance and better opportunities for their children. Uh, so know that like, even though this is primarily, I'm talking about the black community moving out, uh, out of the South and moving up north into the West, it was also white people doing it too. Uh, and the education system was far better up north at this time than the Southern states. Now, the last thing I got for you here, this is, uh, there's nothing that you have to write down. I'm not asking you to copy the map, but you can see the roots of how people were leaving. Kind of like, and these are really, if you looked at a map showing major rail lines back at the time, that's primarily what people are getting on. They're getting on trains and they're moving out of the south and to the north. So these it should be kind of like arrows you're seeing where they're moving up. Now, <clears throat> you typically moved almost in the most direct line possible. Why would you do that? Why would a black person or a white person living in Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, why would they choose to come up to Chicago or Detroit instead of New York or California? Well, it's because you get, could get the cheapest train ticket in a direct line and kind of the shortest route. Uh, so typically, and this isn't a 100% ironclad rule, uh, but if you were in like Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, or Kentucky, like I said, my family were poor farmers in Kentucky, most of them moved directly up north into like this northern Midwest area and came to Chicago, Milwaukee, Toledo, uh, Detroit. A lot were coming into the auto industry in Detroit. And Detroit at this time was one of the top 10 uh, population cities in America. And a lot of people would say it was kind of like Detroit was like, maybe the best city in America. It was really booming and thriving because of what was going on in the auto industry. There was a lot of money there. It was a beautiful, pristine city back then. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of was the situation. Now, if you had been living over in Florida, Georgia, in the Carolinas or Virginia, most of the blacks or whites migrating up north there would have gone directly up and they would have hit places like Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York. They would have gone up there that way. And then a lot of the, the blacks or whites that wanted to get out of the south that were in Arkansas, Louisiana or Texas, a lot of those were the ones that were taking that train ride out west and getting into places in California. All right. Hopefully that all made sense. If you have any questions, uh, hit me up today. There was no additional assignment for you to do other than, than to get this stuff in your notes. And if you missed any assignments this week, for goodness sakes, please get them in. I'll even extend that Q&A from yesterday one more day. So make a response on that if you haven't already. All right. Bye.